but uh, after, after this morning, we'll be halfway through the book of Daniel. So <laughs> if you're getting tired of Daniel, you've only got six more months to go. So uh, no, it's, it's really not that long of a book, but to me, it's a, it's a fascinating book. And I think that we'll be concluding this morning with the sixth chapter of Daniel is the historical narrative part of Daniel. First six chapters are a historical narrative of the time that Daniel lived in Babylon, in Babylonian captivity. And the final six chapters are actually the prophecies of Daniel. Uh, many, much of that, those prophecies, most of them took or happened late in Daniel's life, around the time that they were approaching the end of the 70 years of captivity and looking forward to returning to Jerusalem to Judah to their homeland. Um, see if I can see if this is working. There it is. So we're going to be in Daniel chapter 6. And if we look at the things that we've covered to this point in the timeline, beginning back in Daniel chapter 1, where Daniel and his fellows were taken captive in the first seizure, the siege of Jerusalem by the Babylonians in 606 B.C. So Daniel, we remember, was among the first of those who were taken captive back into Babylon. And he, was, he and his fellows were specifically chosen by those who took them captive to be trained to serve in the palace of the king, to serve, the, to serve as advisors to the king because they were of the people of those who were captive. They knew about the, the culture and the traditions and the religion of the Jewish people and the king hoped to use that to his advantage by having those young men serve him and, and advise him about <clears throat> their people. And so Daniel was a part of that and in 603 BC, so three years later, so Daniel's gone through his three years of training and we find that the first test of or actually the second test of Daniel's faith comes when Nebuchadnezzar has the dream and no one can interpret it and he sends for Daniel and his fellows. He's putting all the wise men and all of his counselors to death because no one can interpret it. But Daniel says, wait, there's someone who can interpret this dream. God. And the one thing that we see, one thing that we see about Daniel through all of this period, and we'll talk more about that, is in that in every situation, including... From the time that he's taken captive, Daniel sees in his circumstances the hand of God. <clears throat> and he sees that in the, in the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And we remember that that dream was actually a prophecy that ta- was going to talk about the successions of kingdoms that would come, the world powers that would come into play before the arrival of the eternal kingdom of God that would be established. And we talked... Uh, about that in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 3, the events of Daniel chapter 3, which is this Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the trial of the fiery furnace when they refuse to worship the image that Nebuchadnezzar has made. That, those events happened in approximately 586 B.C., so some 20 years after the original captivity of, of Daniel and his fellows. That's also the time that the final captives were taken out of Jerusalem. There were three times that the Babylonians besieged Jerusalem because of the continuing um, uh, revolts that the, that the Jewish people brought, that they had to keep going in and, and knocking them back down and, and uh, taking more people captive, killing more of them. And finally, in 586, they completely destroy the city. They destroy the temple, they destroy the cities, they knock down the walls, they level Jerusalem. <clears throat> so, again, that's approximately 20 years after Daniel's initial captivity. In 565 B.C., um, so some 20 years plus years later, we find the events of Daniel chapter 4, when Nebuchadnezzar is lifted up with pride and we see how God humbles him. And through a seven-year period, he is humbled. And at the end of that time, he, he glorifies God. He recognizes that everything he has, all that he's been given in this life, was given to him by God. And that he, he magnifies God on that behalf. In 562 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar dies. The last 
time we studied, we, we studied Daniel chapter 5, and we read the accounts of Belshazzar when he, when he also is like his grandfather, lifted up with pride, and, and how God gives the writing on the wall that's interpreted by Daniel, which foretells the, the end of the Babylonian Empire, the end of Belshazzar's kingdom and that of his father Nabonidus. And we see on that night that the Medes and the Persians actually come into, come into Babylon and they, they capture the city and they kill uh, Belshazzar and they take control. So that succession of kingdoms that Daniel had described that God had foretold in Nebuchadnezzar's dream back in Daniel chapter 2 begins to, begins to take place. So the Babylonian Empire comes to an end and the time of the Medes and the Persians arrives. And so we now arrive at uh, Daniel chapter 6. And Daniel chapter 6 is, is in, it's either 539, 538. It's right in that period of time. So what's interesting to note here is that the time that's elapsed. So from the time that Daniel was taken captive, it's been 67 or 68 years. <clears throat> if Daniel was somewhere between the ages of 15 and 20, when he was taken captive, which in all likelihood that's how old he was, sometime in his mid to late teens or early 20s, Daniel's now an old man. Daniel is in his 80s. He's probably either in his, he's in his mid to late 80s, depending on how old he actually was when he was taken captive. So Daniel's no longer <clears throat> this young, this youth, <laughs> but Daniel's, Daniel's, Daniel's in his later years. Daniel's in his 80s. Um, you know, when, when we reach our older years, we look forward to slowing down. We look forward to retirement. We don't exactly look forward to greater challenges, but we find that Daniel, like many of us may experience, is maybe the greatest challenges we'll find in, later in life, in our latter part of life. But like every other time in Daniel's life, Daniel relied on God to see him through those times. <clears throat> And we'll see that also in Daniel chapter 6. So we begin in verse 1. It says, And it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satra satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And that word satraps is not one that we're used to using, but it basically, what it, what it meant was he was dividing up Babylon and, and the areas controlled that had formerly been controlled by the Babylonians, the area over which now Darius who served under Cyrus, who was the king of all of the Medes and the Persians, Darius being somewhat of a sub-king, or he had given the authority, was given the authority to rule over the former Babylonian empire. He's dividing, dividing that up into provinces. So he's dividing it up into 120 provinces, and he's setting over those provinces rulers or governors uh, in, over each of those. <clears throat> It says, and there were three governors, over these three governors of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. So he established this hierarchy of these 120 provinces, each with their own ruler. And then over those rulers, he assigned, there were three governors of which Daniel was one. So again, <clears throat> we, see, we see the remarkable nature of, of Daniel and the Spirit of God that dwelled in Daniel in that here is another kingdom that is taken over for the Babylonians. And we remember from chapter 5 that Daniel was called in by Belshazzar to interpret the writing on the wall. And at that point, Daniel, who at one point under Nebuchadnezzar had been the prime minister, a second into command, to Nebuchadnezzar, but in the years that intervened, he had kind of fallen into obscurity. Well, when this writing on the wall happens, the queen, the mother of uh, Belshazzar, remembers Daniel and refers her son to him. He calls in Daniel, and Daniel interprets the, uh, the writing, and because of that, he is once again promoted to basically the position of prime minister. So when the, the Medes and the Persians conquer, who's in charge? <laughs> It's Daniel. And so they, I'm sure that, the, uh, <clears throat> that Darius, who, who is given charge here, given the authority to rule, wonders about Daniel, who is one of the captives, having this high position. And so we find he, apparently he learns very quickly uh, 
the wisdom that, that is in Daniel and, and the experience that he has had over the past 60 plus years of being in an administrative position over all of this country and, and the experience that he has in that and he recognizes his, the value that he would be in Daniel to put him as one of his top governors and so he puts him in that position. And it says, and then Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps because an excellent spirit was in him and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the more that Darius knew, came to know Daniel, the more he was impressed by Daniel. And, and he was thinking about Daniel not being just one of three in control, but again, uh, promoting Daniel to a position where he is overall, again, the prime minister's answering only to the king. <clears throat> so the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. Wow. <laughs> Human nature's never changed, has it? Um, so as soon as it appears that Daniel's going to get this promotion, those who were on the same level, those other two governors become, they become jealous, right? <clears throat> I would venture to say that Daniel did not seek nor desire to be the prime minister. I'm, I, the scripture doesn't say that, but I, but I know from the previous chapter when Belshazzar promised him that position, Daniel was like, I'm going to do the right thing. If you want to promote me, you can, but that's not the reason I'm going to interpret this writing. It wasn't, I don't think Daniel had a desire for that. I think Daniel, again, is, he's in his 80s. <clears throat> He's, a, he's approaching the end of his life. Not only is he approaching the end of his life, he knows, as we're going to read in Daniel chapter 9, that they're approaching the end of that 70 years of captivity. That time is about to come to an end. <clears throat> and so Daniel, like us many times, probably just wants to be left alone. <laughs> you know, He probably just wants to do his job and he's going to be faithful to that job and do his best at his job, but he's not seeking the promotion. But those around him in, in envy, because, he's, because of the excellent spirit that is in him and because of his value that is perceived by Darius, they are, they're, they're going to seek to destroy him because they do desire that position. <clears throat> but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful. So the first thing that they did... Again, time has, times haven't changed, have they? When, you, when politicians are competing for the same office, what happens? First thing they're going to do is go out and try to dig up dirt on the other, right? And so that's what they're trying to do to Daniel. They're going to seek, they're going to look into his past. They're going to look into his, the, what he does on a day-to-day -day basis. They're going to find some way to accuse him, to make him look bad in front of Darius so that he does not receive this promotion over them. But said there was no error or fault found in him in all of these things. So as they went about seeking to find that dirt, there was no dirt. They couldn't find anything to accuse Daniel of. And they said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So the one thing that they perceived as a weakness in Daniel was his faith in God. And they said, if we can find some way to use that against him... That's the, way, that's the way we'll undermine him. That's the way we'll get rid of him. And so the governors and the satraps thronged before the king. And they, and they said, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators, the satraps, the counselors, and the advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. So what had they come to the conclusion? So what, what were they doing? They were following Daniel around. They were seeing what he did. They were seeing his habits. And what did they discover? You know what Daniel did every day? Daniel opened his windows in his, in his room, in his house, in his apartment, wherever it was that he lived. He opened his windows toward Jerusalem, and he got on his knees, and he prayed to God. <clears throat> And they said, this is the way that we entrap him. So they go, so they, they, they come up with this scheme and they say, okay, we'll go to Darius. We'll say, oh king, you're the, you're, you know, the great king. And for 30 days, 
let's make, let's make it a law that if anyone seeks uh, petitions to any god or to any man besides you, that, we're gonna, that they'll be cast into the lion's den. Now, Darius is not at all <laughs> aware of what, what they're trying to do. He's, he's, he sees, obviously, he sees no evil intent in what they're, what they're doing. And, I've, and there was one writer who said, Darius probably, or perhaps he thought that this may be a good way to, to better know those people who I rule over. So that if they have a petition, if they have a need that they would come to me, they would tell me what it is. That way I could intervene in that situation and I could, you know, be, they would be loyal to me as a good king. I don't know. I don't know if that's what Darius was thinking. Maybe, maybe he was just flattered by the fact that, you know, these, these, his, his counselors thought him so great that he should be the one that people are asking uh, these petitions of. For whatever reason, Darius was, was not, had no perception of what they were doing. And so they said, now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So what that meant was once he signed this into law, it couldn't be changed. Not even he could change it. Once he had signed it, it was, it was kind of like the Constitution. There, you know, you had, would have to have a constitutional convention. I don't know how they would do it to change the, change the, the law, but, but it was un, basically unchangeable. And it says, therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. So, so Darius goes through, again, unsuspecting of what these guys are plotting, um, goes ahead and signs, signs the decree into law. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before God, as was his custom since his early days. <sighs> Darius, I would venture to say, had no idea of what they were plotting. I would also venture to say that Daniel <laughs> knew exactly what they were doing. And that's the reason he didn't change what he was doing. You know, it would have been easy for Daniel. The decree was only for 30 days. Daniel could have thought, you know, it's only 30 days. I'll just keep my windows closed when I pray. I can still pray. They're not going to know I'm praying. <clears throat> but Daniel said no. And you know, and it had to cross Daniel's mind what had happened to, his, to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, when we read that account, we, re we remember that Daniel was not actually even mentioned in that chapter as being present. And we don't know where he was at that time. But I'm sure that he remembers the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because now he's in a very similar situation. <clears throat> he could hide his faith in God for 30 days and probably... He come out of this unscathed, but he says, no. I think Daniel saw in this an opportunity to glorify God. Daniel in his whole life had done exactly what he was doing now. <clears throat> he opened his windows toward Jerusalem. From the time that probably he had arrived in Babylon, this, this had been his custom. It said this had been his custom since early days. That may just point back to the time that he was a child <clears throat> that he had learned and made the habit of praying to God three times a day, or at least probably refers back to early on in the time, his time in Babylon, that he made this habit. <clears throat> you know, there's some interesting parallels, what's going, what's happening here, and some prophetic words by Solomon at the time. <clears throat> that he dedicated the, temp, dedicated the temple back in 2 Chronicles chapter 6. And we go back and we read this, and this is Solomon is praying to God, and he's praying about the dedication of the temple, and he's praying for the children of Israel. And here in verses 26 and 27 he says, And when they sin against you, talking about the children of Israel, he says, For there is no one who does not sin. So, Jewish people at that time recognized that none of us were out without sin, that we're all going to come short of the glory of God. 
He said, and you become angry with them and deliver them to the enemy, and they take them captive to a land far or near. This is hundreds of years before the Babylonian captivity. There, there, are, there are some very prophetic words here that I'm sure Solomon is, is unaware of, what he's, of, of the prophecy that he's making. Yet when they come to themselves in the land where they are carried captive and repent and make supplication to you in the land of their captivity, saying, we have sinned, we have done wrong, we have committed wickedness. He says, Lord, we know we're gonna, there's times we're going to sin. He said, when, when, when the people sin and when you allow them to be taken captivity, and in the land that they're captive, they repent and they turn to you and they confess their sins, he says, and when they return to you with all their heart, and with all their soul in the land of their captivity where they have been carried captive, listen, and pray toward their land which you gave their fathers, the city which you have chosen, and toward the temple which I have built for your name. You don't think Daniel knew that scripture? <laughs> I'll bet you he knew that scripture. Probably from the time that he arrived in Babylon. <clears throat> trained up as a youth in the word of God, in nobility, close to the palace. Daniel knew God, and Daniel knew the word of God, and Daniel knew this, knew, I would venture to say, knew this scripture, because that's exactly what he did. Why did he open his windows toward Jerusalem? Because that's what Solomon had prophesied when you're in that captive land, he said, you turn back to the land that God gave your fathers, to the city of Jerusalem that he has chosen, to this temple which I have built and which God has sanctified. And that's what Daniel did. <clears throat> and was Daniel going to turn his back on that when, he was when his faith was challenged by those who would subvert him? And the answer was no. This was not the first time Daniel's faith was challenged. Daniel's faith had been challenged from the time that his feet left Jerusalem. <clears throat> and Daniel was faithful in that. And Daniel had seen the faithfulness of God to preserve him, to give him wisdom, to promote him to a position of influence in the land in which he was captive. And Daniel, I would say, had full confidence in God preserving him here. Much like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who when they were faced with the fiery furnace, when they were demanded to bow the knee to the idol which Nebuchadnezzar had made or to face the fiery furnace, they said, you know what, we know that God's able to save us. God may not save us from this, but whether he chooses to or not, we're not going to bow the knee to an idol. We're not going to worship anyone but the true God. And I'm sure that was something that Daniel probably crossed Daniel's mind at this time, that he too was going to be faithful in the, in the situation that God had called him to. <clears throat> Solomon went on to say, Then hear from heaven your dwelling place their prayer and their supplications and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you. <clears throat> you know, when we get again to Daniel chapter 9, we'll see again the parallel and what Daniel in the prayer that Daniel makes there and the, the prayer that Solomon makes in 2nd Chronicles it said then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God so the trap was set <clears throat> it was easy for them all they had to do they probably knew exactly the time that Daniel was pray, going to pray his prayers were in habit there were he had set aside specific times each day that he went to God in prayer. All they had to do was show up, look in the window, listen to Daniel's prayer, and they've got the evidence they need now to go back before Darius and accuse Daniel. Some things that we, we, we know Daniel, we, rem, we think of Daniel as a man of prayer, and, we, and we're not going to talk, I'm not going to talk a lot about how we pray um, this morning, I think there's some great lessons we have out there, and, and I remember Ian's lesson on the prayer closet that 
uh, is a great uh, thing to go back and remind ourselves of, of how we pray and the importance of prayer. But some things we know specifically about Daniel, number one, is that he prayed consistently. So again, he, prayer to him was a habit. <clears throat> it, wasn't, it wasn't a habit in that he just went through the motions, but he, there were certain times of day, there were certain times that he purposely, which is the second thing we're going to talk about, he purposefully went to God in prayer. So he established those times. And the, the um, example for us, the, the lesson for us is <clears throat> make, make time to pray. Make time to pray. It, it, you know, our prayer life is so important. And whether that means we, we purposely get up early to pray or we make it our time to pray as we drive to work or we make it our time to pray when we come home for lunch or we make it our time to pray when we arrive home, whatever that time is, before we go to bed, that we somehow we create the habit of every day spending time with God in prayer. That was, that's the first lesson that we learned from Daniel's prayer. Now, number two is that he was purposeful. <clears throat> Again, when we look at the admonition with the prayer of, of Solomon, we know that and, and the description of, of how Daniel prayed, it says, first of all, that he always, was, he always gave thanks. He was always thankful, and that's, that's the thing he did. He gave thanks to God. <clears throat> but in Daniel chapter 9, we're going to see the other thing he always prayed for. He, he prayed for his people. He prayed for God's people. And he looked forward to and he prayed for that eventual return that they would have. And so, you know, when Jesus taught us to pray, he taught us to pray that, that the, your kingdom come. And we know that God's kingdom is, is here now, but we... We pray for God's kingdom, for God's people. <clears throat> we pray for deliverance from temptation. I'm sure much. I'm sure Daniel prayed for, for similar things to that. But whatever the things that specifically Daniel prayed for, they were done earnestly. <clears throat> and that's where the description of the uh, those who spied on him said that he was he prayed in, with supplications or earnest pleadings, or there were specific things that that he was praying to God for either in his life or the life of those of other of God's people. <clears throat> so three things that we can can learn and we can use in our own prayer life. Number one, that we do it consistently, that we're purposeful in prayer and that we're earnest in our prayers, that we are truly sincere in the things we ask of ask of God. <clears throat> one of my go-to verses. <clears throat> In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Philippi says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Those same three characteristics or uh, uh, components of Daniel's prayer. Thanksgiving, prayer, prayer being, being asking um, for, the, for our needs and the needs of others. Acknowledging God as the supreme ruler of of the universe and our heavenly Father, and with supplication and with earnest pleading. So basically, does as God as Daniel prayed, so so our prayers should be no different today. Let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Those promises we have from God when we earnestly pour out our hearts to Him in prayer and leave our our, our troubles there and asking him to intercede in those situations that God, God answers. And we, we have the assurance of that. Therefore, God gives us that peace and God guards our hearts and minds, much like he guarded Daniel's in the challenges that he faced. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree and said, have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. And the king answered and said, this is true, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot alter. So he, they go back. They want to make sure the trap is set before they expose the evidence. So, okay, king, you signed this decree, right? You're, anybody who asks a petition of anybody else besides you for 30 days, we're going to cast them into the lion's den. And he said, yeah, that's what it is. And I signed it according to the law of the Medes and Persians. It can't be changed. And they go, yes. <laughs> you, can, you can almost sense their glee and their giddiness that, wow, we pulled this off. We, everything went according to plan. So they answered and said before the king, that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, 
So number one, again, they don't acknowledge Daniel, who's one of your governors, one of your top advisors. No, he's one of those captives from Judah. Does not show regard for you, O king, and, he, and for the decree that you have signed and makes his petition three times a day. And suddenly Darius goes, oh, how could I have been so stupid? Why didn't I see through this what they were doing? And he says, and when the king heard these words, he was greatly displeased with himself. And set his, set his heart on Daniel to deliver him and labor till the going down of the sun to deliver him. He's going, golly, why didn't I see that? You ever felt like that? <laughs> ah, yeah, he was, I've been there. How could I have been so stupid to not see through that one? <clears throat> that was Darius. And so Darius, who's the king, who signed the decree, is going through all, uh, probably, I don't know, Franklin, all of his law books, <laughs> trying to find that loophole <laughs> to get out of this one, and, and he can't find it. There's no loophole there. <clears throat> he said he labored till the going down of the sun. But the conclusion was, there was no way out. Those, those Daniel's accusers sense this, and so they come back when they see the delay that's happening with Darius, and they say, the men approached the king and said, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no decree or statute with the king established can be changed. That's the rules. You can't change it. You can look all you want, but it's done. You've already you've signed... You've signed the death warrant for Daniel. That's basically what they're saying. So the king gave the command and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. <clears throat> Again, these guys felt like they had pulled off the perfect crime, <laughs> so to speak. <clears throat> Their plan was flawless. I'm sure they were celebrating their, their wisdom and their conniving and how they had pulled this off because now they're, uh, the person of their, their hate, their hatred, Daniel, is cast into the den of lions. They almost took everything into account. Well, the one thing they didn't take into account was God. <clears throat> and you know, when we see evil people appear to succeed for a time, always know that God will have the last word. <clears throat> God will always have the last word. It is God who rules in the affairs of men and God's will will be done. <clears throat> but the, speak, the king spoke saying to Daniel, your God whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. That's a remarkable statement. Darius did everything in his power to figure out how to get Daniel out of this situation to save Daniel's life. There was, no, there was no way he could do it in the position that he was in because he had signed the decree. But to look at Daniel for the period of time that he had known him and recognize not only the faith of Daniel, but the power of the God that Daniel worshiped is a remarkable thing. And that tells us a lot more about the character of Daniel. <clears throat> that Daniel's life and his faith in God was transparent. <clears throat> the people recognized that faith. And Darius, in a short time, probably knew and came to know all of the history of Daniel in the, in the time of the Babylonians about the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, about how God had preserved Shadrach, Mac, Meshach, and Abednego, <clears throat> about how the wisdom of, of God given to Daniel interpreted those dreams, how Nebuchadnezzar had been humbled before God, and the decree that he had, he had uh, sent to the world following that, acknowledging God and glorifying God. Darius may have not had faith in God, but Darius had faith in Daniel's faith. And so he says to Daniel, your God whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. So he had confidence and hope at least that God would deliver Daniel where he could not. <clears throat> 
Again, we look to going to the reading of this morning. <clears throat> and thank Brother Lonnie for the reading. I think if we think about the life of the Apostle Paul, you know, the, the thing about Daniel, and, and another remarkable thing about Daniel is we, we recognize Daniel as this person who, who had tremendous faith and tremendous loyalty and tremendous faithfulness in the life he lived before God. Sometimes the thing that we overlook and we forget is that Daniel <laughs> did not choose his circumstances. <clears throat> Daniel did not choose the circumstances that he was called to. <clears throat> you know, again, Daniel is a young man. He's, he's brought up in royalty. He's in nobility. Don't know exactly what position his parents, his father had, but it was some position of nobility. And, and he, uh, he was brought up close to the palace because that's what the book of Daniel tells us about when they chose the young men to serve, that they looked for those who had that experience. And I'm sure that, and again, Daniel, we see that he had probably a tremendous upbringing and that parents who, who brought him up in the will of God, to know the will of God, to know the law of God, to know the word of God, and to trust in God, that all of these things he had as a youth, and he probably looked forward to a career in the Jewish hierarchy. He probably looked forward to like any other young person, to, to marrying and having children and having a family and living you know, to an old age and in that type of environment. And as a teenager, basically the rug was pulled out from under him all, on all accounts. <clears throat> he, says, he sees his country besieged by a foreign army. And to his horror, <laughs> I'm sure... As a teenager, he's, he is taken by these soldiers and he's brought before someone who interrogates him to determine if he's one that they can use to serve in the house of Nebuchadnezzar. That had to be a, that had to, had to be a terrible experience. And then to be carried some 1,500 miles to a foreign land. And when he's brought there, he's, he's put under the charge of the chief, chief of the eunuchs which we would anticipate means that he was made a eunuch. And then he's, then he's given a new name. His name is changed to not reflect the glory of, his, of God, but to reflect the, the glory of a pagan God. <clears throat> Daniel never chose those circumstances. You and I would never chose those circumstances. And you wonder if Daniel ever went, why me? <laughs> why is this happening to me? <clears throat> Do you ever ask yourself that? <clears throat> you ever look at your circumstances and go, why me, God? Why, why have you given me this body? Why have you given me this family? Why have you given me this mental intellect? <clears throat> why have you given me these abilities? Why have you put me in this congregation? Why have you put, given me this time and place in which to live? Have you ever looked at your circumstances and said, it's not fair? This is not fair. My circumstances are not fair. Did any, if anybody had a right to do that, it was probably Daniel. Did Daniel ever once, we don't know. He may have, he may have gone through those mental gymnastics at times wondering why me. But the one thing that we saw that, again, that Daniel portrayed in his life was that in those circumstances, he saw the hand of God. In whatever circumstances he was in, he was faithful to the circumstance to which God had called him to. He embraced. Rather than revolt and rebel against those circumstances, he embraced those circumstances to be faithful and true to God in those circumstances. You know, and, that, and I used the Apostle Paul and the words of the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4 to say, you know, Paul was no different. <clears throat> Paul was no different to try to get out of the circumstances to which he was called, but he embraced those circumstances. He counted it all joy like James when he was brought to trial to embrace those difficult times, to see them as an opportunity to glorify God in the life that he lived. 
<clears throat> For I have learned in whatever state I am, Paul says, to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound everywhere in all things. I have learned to be both full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, through Christ who strengthens me. So it is with you and I in the specific situation and circumstances that God has called us to. I believe that God has equipped each of us to, to be in those circumstances. Not to rebel against them, but to embrace them. To be faithful in God in the most difficult of times that God might be glorified through the lives that we live. <clears throat> then the stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring with the signets of his lords that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. They said they took Daniel, they put him in the den and then they sealed the door. <clears throat> And they, and they put the seal, they put the clay around the stone, they put their insignets on it. Nobody under penalty of death would remove that stone. Anything that was going to happen from that point forward was simply between Daniel and the lions and God. <laughs> there would be no question about who preserved Daniel. Because there would be no funny business that would happen outside that cave to change any of the circumstances within. <clears throat> now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting and the old musicians were brought before him. Also his sleep went from him and the king arose early in the morning and then went in haste to the lion's den. So uh, Darius was a wreck. I mean, he, his, the guilt that was on him from the... From the from his foolishness as he perceived it to allow this thing to happen and not be able to undo it. And now his hope that God would, would save Daniel, he was up worrying about it all night. And as soon as it was morning, he, he, he went to the den. He wanted, he wanted to see if God had preserved Daniel. How did Daniel spend that night? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I would, but I would venture to say that Daniel did not spend that night in fear. I would say that Daniel spent that night in resolve, that what happened was going to happen, but his, his faith and his dependence was upon God, and he believed that God would bring him through it. Whether Daniel slept that night or not, I don't know. He may have. He may have simply laid down the scriptures. We're going to see <clears throat> says that God sent his angel to close the mouths of the lion. And then... When he came to the end, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel, and the king spoke, saying, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? And then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. There had to be such relief from Darius when he actually heard Daniel talking back to him. I don't know if Darius did any praying that night to the true God of heaven. But if he did, it was an answer to his prayer, right? When he heard the voice of Daniel, there had to be such relief on the part of Darius. And Daniel said, My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have none, done no wrong before you. There was no guilt before Darius, and Darius knew it when he had to put Daniel in the lion's den. There was nothing Daniel had done deserving of that. And Daniel held true to his faith in God and his actions and continuing to, to pray and glorify God despite the law that had been made. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. And so Daniel was taken out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. That's a powerful statement. <clears throat> That's a powerful statement. You know, in a way, this account that we know from the time we're small children about Daniel in the lion's den is a microcosm of the Jewish people in Babylon. That it was by God's hand that he, they were allowed to be taken captive. And in a sense... They were at the mercy of the lions from the time that they were in captivity. 
but the thing that preserved them through 70 years to allow the faithful to return to Jerusalem and protected them through them, that time was the hand of God. It was God who closed the mouths of the lions around them, who preserved them, who allowed them to basically live normal lives in captivity and then once again return to their homeland. How powerful is our belief in God? How powerful is faith in God? Not merely a superficial belief, but to be wholly trusting in God. And that trust, that faith was exhibited again by Daniel from the time that his feet left Jerusalem <clears throat> till the time his feet left the den of the lions. <clears throat> It was not something that was new. And the king gave the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel and they cast them into the den of lions. Them, their children, their wives, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. <clears throat> There's an interesting, cult, an interesting color that's added by, to, by Josephus. Whether it's actually accurate, I, I don't know, but I think it's interesting. Josephus reports that following Daniel coming out of the den, that his accusers, seeing that he was not harmed, made an accusation and said, the only reason he wasn't killed is y'all fed those lions until they were full, and so they, they didn't have any more appetite when you threw Daniel in there. And the king said, okay, we'll see about that. Feed those lions. Feed them all they'll eat. When they've eaten all they want, you and your family are going in. 